Good morning. Good morning. Let me start by saying there are three things I want to do quickly and get right into the sharing of, of uh, this missionary story. I want to tell you a little bit about Wadi Moon. Uh, I want to uh, share a little bit about our ministry uh, that produced this book and the 20 giants that are in this book that we will talk about and how God has used them uh, to reach throughout Asia. And uh, then I want to turn it over to our pastor to, to finish. Father Moon was a Southern Baptist missionary of the 19th century that literally gave her life for those that she won to Christ, uh, those that she ministered to, the famine hit China, uh, though she still had her salary, it went to pay for food for everybody that she knew in her church family, in her spiritual family, and she died of starvation uh, on the way home. They finally started to bring her home. So out of that, we, as Southern Baptists, chose to make her the leading lady of our mission offering called Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. What is that? Well, the Southern Baptists of our 40 plus thousand, 40 something thousand churches, I, the, the number keeps moving on me, I don't know, 42, 44, whatever, there's a whole bunch of us scattered all over the United States. And we choose, as you choose, to give a percentage of your offering to the cooperative program and a quarter, uh, a, a quarter of every dollar that we give through our cooperative program goes to your missionaries was 5,000 when I was on the field. Now we're down to about 3,500. And we're supported, we're, we're helped, we're, we can do our work, we can do God's work because of that. But then in December, you and I get off of our plastic and get out of our money and we put an offering with our heart into the Lion Moon Christmas offering that doubles, that 100% increases all that we have given for 11 months. What does that mean? Your missionaries can buy food, can rent a house, can get a vehicle, can buy material, can go to share the gospel in various ways across all barriers. And you're going to hear about some of those barriers in just a minute. Everything you hear that I talk about today, Lottie Moon provided. I want you to get that in mind. All that I did, all that Barbara and I did for 31 years, and 15,000 more like us, 14,999 or 98. All of this came because you, as Southern Baptists, cared enough you reach inside of your heart before you reach inside of your pocketbook and you sacrificed sometimes you gave up things you wanted sometimes you gave up doing or going some places you wanted to go so that a missionary could go where he was supposed to go he could feed his family when they got sick he could get them to the hospital uh, when uh, there was an emergency, he could get them out of harm's way. So you provided that. Amen. And you still do. We've been doing this for a couple hundred years. Well, not quite that. Uh, 150 years. So when you think about all that I'm going to talk you, to you about, consider lighting on Christmas song. That's what we're going to do at the end of this month. We're going to make a sacrificial offering. You and I. And we're going to give deeply, and we're going to give so that the gospel can go to people like you're going to hear about in just a minute. Barbara and I recall, she at age 16, I later, to share the gospel with the nations. We went to Indonesia for 15 years and planted churches in East Java and Bali, the very first church, in, a Baptist church in Bali. And then God called us back home for five years for retooling, and then he sent us to do what this book describes. We went for 16 years, we traveled 
through 12 Asian nations teaching pastors, lay pastors, church planners, and primary church leaders in 53 groups scattered over 12 nations, and we taught them twice a year. We and six other couples like us. We'd go in and out, top of mountains, in slums, uh, in uh, down rivers, uh, in out in the boonies where you had to mail sunshine to get to us. Uh, we went to crazy places. We went to dangerous places. We went to great places to train those wonderful men and women that had been produced from your ministry as Southern Baptists. We won many of these to Christ. We helped them get started. We gave them the vision. And then we went to help them expand their vision to reach their people. I could reach one or two. They could reach a thousand. That's the, that's the absolute truth. Barbara and I could teach 1,500 a year, and they would have 25,000 to 30,000 people that they were touching and winning and bringing into God's kingdom. That's the way it is. We're just a catalyst. We're just there to spark. And when we do, they catch fire and they go. Listen to them. We're going to go to Nepal. Little nation full of mountains. You may have heard about them, called Himalayas, uh, the, top, the top of the world. And we're going to talk to you about one of these top of the world men. He's the top of my world. We met Brother Rai in Itahari, which is the flatlands of East Nepal. The Young Nepali Baptist Convention requested leave to train a group of lay pastors and church leaders who lived out on the Tarai flatland of eastern Nepal. The leadership seminar was also accessible by a few mountain men who were church planners in that upper region uh, of the Himalaya mountains. By brother Rai was one of them. He had walked three eight-hour days to get to the Tarai, where then he took a bus for another five hours in order to get to Itahari. By Rai had been invited to attend one of the first Baptist teaching lead seminars in order to become equipped to teach and start churches in the upper regions where oxygen was rarer than it was in Itahari. Our first personal meeting took place during a morning break of that first seminar. Rye was sat on a rock, warming himself in the mid-morning sunshine with his shoes off. I walked over and knelt beside him. Daniel Suba, the local pastor of the Baptist church where we conducted the seminar, was a very good translator and introduced me to Bai Rye. One of Rye's feet was puffed and reddish from infection. We talked about getting him some medicine from a local shop. Brother Rye was so appreciative in, of the attention. He had learned a little Brit English from the British in the yesteryear and could communicate on a limited basis. Seeing that Rye was definitely older, 62 at that time, I asked him, Bye Rye, what are you doing here? Why aren't you home with grandkids sitting in your lap? He smiled and gave an answer that has forever embedded itself into my heart. Brother Harry, if I don't go, they will never know. He went on to explain that his limited exposure to actual Bible study made it difficult for him to answer many questions from the Hindus that he was trying to win to Christ. Rye was excited because after studying for only two days, many of their he was sure he could answer many of their questions. And with an engaging smile, he went on to add, now that I know more, I go more. Another older participant, Brother Dill, sat beside Rutna Rai on the thatch mat, which covered the dirt floor of the Baptist Church building. Brother Dill made Rai look like a teenager, as Dill was 92 years old. He had heard the gospel late in life and responded to Christ after all of his children had grown up and gone. Though he was basically uneducated, Dill insisted on his children getting schooled. All had become successful professionals while Dill continued living near the poverty line in his old farmhouse. 
The frosty wind and the bitter cold in the poly winter would blow through the rough hewn planks of the walls of his old house. He slept on some padded bed slats that did not quite qualify as a mattress. He often climbed switchback the switchback trail that connected his village with a small town below where he bought his supplies. More importantly to him, Dill went up and down these switchbacks to attend church every Sunday where he worshiped his Lord Jesus. Dill's family had been horrified when he became a Christian. They commanded their father to renounce that foreign religion. They said, give up this Christ and we will ensure that you will live in a comfort for the rest of your life. Impossible, cried Dill without compromise. My Lord didn't live in comfort, and neither will I. Byrai was led by the Holy Spirit to an unusual church planning strategy. When the conditions allowed, he made seven, a seven-day clockwise trek from his mountain village. We're talking about 18,000 to 20,000 feet high. Sometimes the scenery was spectacular. The snow-covered Himalayan peaks expressed their glory toward their creator, who was above the rich, <clears throat> who was above the richest blue sky ever seen on earth. At other times, the bitter, frozen wind attacked anything that stood upright and expelled all hidden heat from every fiber in the body. When in slick rain or icy blowing snow, Rye took the next step <coughs> and then another until he arrived back at his destination. There was a cost. A position came in the form of some beatings. Others threw rock, rocks at Rye as though he were a rabid dog, accompanied by some hateful names shouted at him by a few Hindu leaders. One of the strongest forces of opposition were the Maoists, who tried to capture the small country of Nepal. None of these things caused Rai to stumble or stopped him from taking the next step. The thing that slowed him down the most was his failing health. Rai began to pass out along the trails he walked. Local villagers often found him and nourished him back to health before he continued his trek. Even strangers found him and took him to the next village where Rai was always welcomed, <coughs> even by non-Christians. He was beloved by most. In, case, uh, in each case, the word would be sent back to his wife and family that he was being taken care of. Rai, therefore, planted church gospel seeds that grew into churches, which after a while started other churches. These pinpricks of light scattered all over that huge mountainside. Rye did all of this by taking the next step. And that's why I named this giant the Himalayan Walker. You reached Rye. You founded his heart, gave him motivation, and gave him something substance-wise to go to his Himalayan neighbors and give his life walking up and down those huge hills. I want to switch over to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the armpit of the world. Some people think India is. India ain't got nothing on Bangladesh. They're, they're packed. They're crowded. They have no good productive land, very little and cyclones slam them every year and kill 10,000 or more by drowning them on the beaches because there's nowhere else to live. Bangladesh is tough, a tough place to be. Salim was a businessman. He accepted Christ as an older man. Uh, God got his entire heart. He then turned to sharing the gospel with a business formula. And he started franchises, and that's what he called them, franchises, all over that country. It was dangerous. People got killed. People got hurt uh, sharing the gospel and worshiping uh, in other places. Tribal pastors also down in the south part of Bangladesh were discriminated because first they were tribal, 
uneducated. Second, they were assumed to be Christian. And so they uh, were discriminated. I want to tell you about one occasion that Barbara and I had after we had uh, been going there for a few years. On one occasion, we arrived in Chittagong on October 6, 2001. After a delightful overnight, we left a, a, on our arranged transportation to the Dasari camp, which was near the town of uh, Banchakakali. We had the pleasure of taking uh, Brother um, Ritun Joy with us, who was our primary translator and seminar coordinator. The jeep took more two hours or more depending on how many vehicles were waiting to get through some of the mud holes that populated the road every few miles. When a truck or bus became stuck, it took a little longer. Plus, we had to cross uh, the wide uh, Karnafuli River by riverboat. That venture, always chaotic, could, take, could be made easier depending on how willing you were to add a little more to the price of tickets. The drive was usually very pleasant, as the two-lane road sometimes reduced to one, weaved in and out of small towns and villages along the way. Much of the road was canopied by large trees, limbs embracing over the road. Even, the trip, even though the trip was pleasant enough, we were always glad to get to camp in order to get organized. We wanted to be settled and prepared to start the seminar. At 8 a.m. Monday morning, after a hearty but spicy breakfast, we launched into the first subject. I noticed there was a lot of whispering and shaking of heads and a slight atmosphere of agitation. This was highly unusual for this group of tribal leaders. Normally they were laser beam focused on what was being taught. I mentioned this to Brother Mouton Roy, and, but he sidestepped the issue. The problem grew during the second hour of study. During the break time, Sajal Malik, told us that the U.S. coalition forces had started bombing Afghanistan that morning. The U.S. was responding to the attack on the Twin Towers of September 11th, 2001. There were wild numbers of casualties being reported, and it was not being received well in this vastly Islamic majority nation. Sajal was clearly nervous. He mentioned that local Muslims in the marketplace were going crazy. He was obviously worried, and so were the tribal leaders, as they were often identified as Christians by, their, by the general Muslim population of Bangladesh. It was at that moment that we received a telephone call confirming everything our brothers and sisters already knew. It was not safe for Americans to be out in public at that time in Bangladesh, and it was especially perilous to be in one of the more radical rural areas at that time. It was also unsafe for Bangladeshi Christians to be out in the open. And this retreat, uh, retreat, Christian retreat center, 50 miles out in the boonies, we were all targets for reprisals from the agitated Muslims. We had to get out. Our leadership organized that a bus would pick us up right after dark and take us to Chittagong. By that time, Sajal had gotten word that there would be an attack on the retreat center that evening to get rid of the, those Americans and Christian preachers. We quickly packed and prayed. It was a long afternoon. We all boarded the bus at dusk with, with a Christian driver. The tribal leaders decided to put Barbara and me in the middle of the bus across the aisle from one another. Then, those precious tribal brothers and sisters enclosed us like a blanket. They decided to keep every window in the bus completely closed. It became a sauna in a split second and remained so for the entire trip. The bus traversed through villages and small towns where mobs of people were out with torches, angrily shouting into the wind. We all knew that if we were discovered, they would most likely burn us alive in that bus. For more than two hours, minute by minute, we held our collective breaths. Each time we slowed to a crawl because of the people flooding into the roads, our blanket wrapped around us even more tightly. <coughs> cherished souls 
who could not speak five understandable words to us with their mouths, spoke volumes of love for us with their hearts by putting their sweat-dripping bodies between us and harm's way. We were so humbled by their extraordinary concern. The very crossing was knuckle-cracking tense. The waiting, the collective sizzle, the sweat dripping on the dirty floor, and the heart pounding seemed to last forever. Once on the other side of the Karnaputhuli River, it was smooth sailing. <coughs> Some finally cracked the windows and, and an audible sigh of relief could be heard. Upon arrival in Chittagong, it was a joy of bounding and all of us were ready for a bath and a bed. <laughs> One year later, we returned to the Desari camp and all went well. However, that bus trip had bonded our hearts like a celestial welding. When you face martyrdom together, it changes something in the very fiber of your being. That experience melted our hearts and souls together. One day in heaven, where language will not be a problem, we may still be talking to each other about that night. With Salim in the north and the tribal leaders of the south, we constantly thank God for the privilege of walking hand in hand with both groups as he did remarkable things in front of us in both areas. I pray for Bangladesh. There are so many problems and so few Christians. And yet you have planted a Baptist convention in that hard land by your hard missionaries works and the, and the men and women that they have won to Christ. India was a place that we went to often. We would go out four months at a time, teach five days, move over the weekend, teach five days, move over the weekend, teach five days, move over the weekend. We'd take a down week about every fifth week, and whether we needed it or not, <clears throat> and uh, recoup and get well. And then after four months of that, we'd go home and get our bodies back in shape and our minds wrapped around with some more teaching that we would teach. We teach two curriculum subjects and a book of the Bible every session to all 53 groups. But this man and this woman were really special. They are giants among giants. And they lived up in the Con Hills. Let me tell you about the honored giants of the hills. The Khan Hills of Orissa, India, have been the home of the Kui people for centuries. Since ancient times, Satan has whispered into the hearts of the Kui, and they've responded. They have had intercourse with evil through the ages, delving into worship of spirits and powers and idols, while prostrating themselves before certain caves, besides special rivers, and on top of select mountains. They had no better choice until the British came and brought Christ, displayed in white buildings and through strange-sounding music, along with other traditions. It was in Malakapuri, just a wide place in the road running through the Khan Hills, where the first queen became a believer in Jesus Christ. Poto Prodan, Pradhan, was baptized into the membership of the Malakapuri Baptist Church, organized by the British missionaries. Then in 1947, the British pulled out of India after India won its independence. By that time, Poto was joined by a host of other queen that worshiped God in that building. The Pradhans produced a child. He was given the name Paul. Paul's life was vastly different than that of his parents. He grew up loving Jesus Christ. He and his siblings went, though a number, smaller number among the queen, found that worshiping God in a church two or three times a week brought deep comfort and great satisfaction. The last human, the last record of human sacrifice among the Kui took place about 200 yards from the Malakapuri Baptist Church. As usual, a young, pure little girl was slaughtered like a ewe lamb and then sacrificed on a fiery altar ignited by the flames of hell. The Pradhams may have witnessed it as it was close to their house. 
Poto called his son to his deathbed in 1955. He charged him with an immeasurable task. Poto said, son, the Brits have gone and taken all their missionaries with them. I'm dying. So I charge you to win our people to Lord Jesus and start churches up and down this great valley. Paul, why do you think we named you Paul? There are no other Pauls in our family. We named you after the Apostle Paul. Therefore, you will be the Apostle Paul to the Quee people, our people. At that time, Paul Prodom was a moderately successful businessman. He sold tea leaves in both the Malakapuri and in the villages in the hills lying on both sides of the large valley. There were almost no roads, only footpaths that linked the interlaced farming villages through those hills. Paul and Mrs. Paul began using those same trails to take the gospel to the Queen. They would often sit by water wells and sing Christian songs. If any were interested, they would share about Jesus and offer to come and explain more in their own homes. They also offered Bibles lessons on how to follow Jesus. Of course, not everyone was happy with the products. Paul and his wife were assaulted by fanatic Hindus. By God's grace, little print pricks of gospel light began to dance in the cruel darkness surrounding Malakapuri. House churches began emerging in village after village. And Paul became exhausted, pedaling his bicycle up and down those rocky pathways, endeavoring to lead Bible studies and preach in as many churches as he could. On one occasion, Paul was late for a worship service being held in one of the first church buildings ever built in that valley. It was dusk, and he was paddling as fast as he, the rocky terrain would allow him when he saw a shadowy lump ahead in the path. Suddenly, the lump moved. That striped lump gracefully got to his four feet and fixed an eerie eye upon Paul. Paul came to a sliding halt, fell off his bike about 20 feet from the large, curious Bengal tiger. The tiger slowly moved into a crouch while never averting his eyes from Paul. For some unexplainable reason, Paul picked up his bicycle and held it up sideways in front of his head and shoulders. According to Paul, the big cat then stood up, shook himself from front to back, turned and trotted down the trail, and eventually bounded off the trail into the forest. After Paul got his heart slowed down a tad, he thought about rushing back home. Then Paul considered that if God had spared him from becoming supper for the big cat, surely he must desire Paul to continue on to the church in order to share God's word with them. So he ventured on to the church. Later that night, Paul returned along the same trail. It surprised no one but Paul himself that God chose him and his wife in extraordinary ways. 30 years later, when we met this legend, he and his wife had planted scores and scores of churches, they had, which had in turn planted hundreds of other churches. Associations of Baptist churches had been planted, and they were moving toward forming a full convention, a Queen Baptist Convention. All of this happened because one untrained man and his small wife were faithful to keep going down a rough, rugged trail, not only to preach the gospel, but to be the gospel. The Apostle Paul Prodder was truly an honored giant in the Con Hills. Stories, accounts, these are not stories, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. These are accounts. Every word of this is true. Barbara and I saw it. We lived it. We were there. This is what God did. And we were there because you gave through the months to the cooperative program as a Southern Baptist Church. And then on month of December, year by year, all 31 years, you gave special, special, special offerings that allowed us to go 
to live, to stay healthy, to raise a family, and to reach many, many people. I want to stop for just a moment, and uh, we won't take long. I know this is a little difficult, but you, I may have created some questions in your mind. If I have, I'd like to give a staccato answer to as many as I can about what I've read, uh, about what we've done. Anybody got a question? Yes, Sandy. What were you thinking when you were on that ride in the bus? Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind? I was thinking that Barbara and I probably wouldn't make it. Uh, the Muslims were crazy. They were, they were shouting and, and they were they were everywhere. They were everywhere. Uh, but let me share this and please understand. This is just what this is what missionaries. This, it's not anything about Barbara and I. But I, I, in fact, I just wrote uh, in a companion book uh, guide for this. Before you ever go overseas, if your life is more important to you than your death to be used for God, don't go. Just don't go. You have got to surrender your life. You've got to say, Lord, if you can use me, if my death can bring more people to Christ, isn't that what Jesus did? And so, there have been two or three times that we came to that conclusion that we probably we may not get out of this one. But the Lord took care of us. Here we are. The other question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, I want to know how you managed to take the children and no. what they thought of all of Thank that. Thank you. Mm. That's a good point. This ministry is only for people who the children are already grown and out of the house. You could we first place the Baptist couldn't have paid for all of our kids to going through all these places. So it had to have been for older couples. It's for couples who had all the families out of the house. Uh, they, but they, no, they were with us when we were in church planning in Indonesia. They grew up in Indonesia in that, but it was a stable home environment uh, until they got to high school and then they were shipped off to a Baptist, well, to a Baptist hostel in a local house, uh, high school. They're the, they, they'll tell you it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I read the book probably at least five weeks ago, and it was so inspiring and moving, moving my heart, mm -hmm. sometimes to tears. I would recommend everybody here read that book. It is much different than the story you told us. Along the same lines, but it's not a repeat. Yeah, yeah there are 20 of these giants. <coughs> There are books in the back after if you, anybody needs one or wants one, I'll be in the uh, court and the whatever it's called, whatever that room back there is called. <laughs> yes, Mr. Bush. People say that you know we don't see a lot of miracles today, but I think you know you saw a lot of miracles there. You should write a book about miracles that you saw, right? Well, I saw a number of miracles. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, it was uh, it, it was so. I mean, what is a miracle? It's just a hand of God coming down and changing something normal. And uh, mm -hmm. he did that a number of times. Thank you for that encouragement. I'll consider it. Yeah. After one or two others, I get <laughs> first. Yes, ma'am. How, how many years were you and Barbara in the missionary field? 31 years. Wow. 15 years church planning, 16 years leadership training. <laughs> God called both of us separately. Called Barbara at age 16 uh, to go to Bali. In fact, she was called specifically to to evangelize Bali. I was crazy, lost at age 16. I, I, the only way I knew to use God was not in a worship. The name of God was not in a worshipful way. He got a hold of me when I was in jump school, and that's a good time to get saved, by the way, if you're going to jump out of an airplane. And uh, so uh, I got saved 
it, in jump school, and then a little later, again, with a parachute accident, that thing that you don't want to ever happen, happened, and out of that parachute accident, my call came to go and share the gospel. And my call was, was to Bali was to share the gospel where I could sh openly proclaim his name. So Indonesia allowed us to do that. I don't want to take too much time, but I want to answer any one or two other questions if you've got them. If not, I don't see any. I'll turn it over to Pastor Scott.